Well, everybody, we've come a long way over these last 13 weeks. Assumably, I wouldn't know, I recorded all of these episodes in the span of about five or six days. But in any case, we're at the finale once and for all. Most of this series has been dedicated to my anime history, to the years before 2012, essentially. A time when I was very deeply into anime and had a constantly evolving taste and a very close relationship on a personal level with the shows that I was watching as they helped me to sort of define my and find my way through life. But then, once I entered the 2010s, I started to have a sort of waning interest in anime for a little while. The shows I was watching just weren't hitting me on that raw, personal level, probably because I was growing up and didn't need shows to sort of do that for me in the way that I did before. I got sidetracked into other fandoms for 2012 and 2013, and when I came back to anime in 2014, it felt like my tastes were completely different. Like, so much of what I'd connected with in shows before, I didn't anymore, and so much of what I was looking for now was coming from a completely different set of shows. When you look at my favorites list, so much of it consists of stuff that came from that early period of me doing anime videos on YouTube. Ghost in the Shell, Psycho Pass, Log Horizon, later returning to Kill La Kill and Gurren Lagann, getting into Hunter Hunter. All of those shows I watched in 2014, or in like the first month of 2015. Revisiting k discovering Ponyo, and it took a while before I even could revisit another show that would make it into my top 10. It was towards the very end of 2015 that I watched Kare Kano, and that sort of broke into the top 10, and it has remained unflinching since. 2016 was a not a great year for me discovering new favorites in any medium. Oh yeah, and I forgot Shirobako also made my list in 2014 as a new show. It's been a long time since I've either rewatched something and felt it was a top 10, or watched something new and thought it was a top 10. And so little of what the top 10 is now is what it was back then. I think the only thing that's currently in my top 10 that would have been in 2011 is Gurren Lagann, and even then it would have been sort of a matter of contest before. So I just want to kind of round out that era to talk about a few more things that I cared about very strongly back then that would have been favorites that I still feel that niggling feeling like, man, my 16-year-old self is crying or kicking himself for not having talked about these back then, but I don't have nearly as much to say about these as I have had to say about some of the other shows. So over the course of this, I've sort of traced my lineage of like what was my favorite anime over time. We had the era where it was like Bebop and Inuyasha, then Rurouni Kenshin, Trigun for a while, Evangelion became the big, the first like really big one, then Haruhi, Welcome to the NHK, later on Gurren Lagann, F A Tale of Memories, which I've mentioned in these podcasts, but I already have a video about it on my channel. But I haven't yet touched on the other two shows that would have been favorites in 2007 and 2008, and one of them which would remain what I considered my number one favorite anime for pretty much the rest of this period, and that's Eureka 7. I watched Eureka 7 in November of 2007, and it was immediately my favorite show because it's this epic coming of age story these really lovable characters you go on this huge adventure with this 50 episode adventure with gorgeous art uh the character designs in Rex 7 are some of my favorites of all time everything that's designers done has been great fantastic music i was obsessed with Ereka. i thought she was just the most beautiful girl and she has such an interesting place in the story because like i suspect many 14 year old 15 year old like teenage boys I was really attracted to like broken girls girls who've been through a lot and I want to be the one to sort of help them out and what's great about Eureka 7 is that while Eureka is that and while Renton feels that way about her the show kind of punishes him for feeling that way like throughout the early part of the show Renton just wants to be this anchor for Ereka, who is sort of a uh, a damaged individual, but she is not desperate. She can take care of herself, and she's better at taking care of herself than Renton is. Renton is just some dumb kid. Ereka is a couple years older than him. She's taking care of three orphaned kids all by herself. She is a capable pilot. She's basically a badass. And so while Renton sees her as someone who he wants to be like her shoulder to lean on, He's actually too weak to do that. He's too much of a of a of just a fucking nobody. And so the whole early part of the show is kind of about everyone just ragging on Renton because he just doesn't seem to understand that he has to earn people's respect and he has to earn the ability 
to be someone who Eureka could rely on. And then even when he does start to earn that ability, he sort of falters in ways. And there's reasons that them being together might not be good for both of them. And there's just a lot that Renton has to learn. And it's a very worldly show. It's an adventure series that makes Renton come to understand a wide variety of people. He has to meet lots of different people, learn lots of different worldviews, and sort of mature as a person by learning what the world actually is. And then in the last arc of the show, it does a phenomenal job of presenting how their relationship does eventually sort of come together by putting it not so much in a romantic context as a familial one. Because again, Eureka has three kids, and so Renton and Eureka kind of have to become parental figures and become like a family. And there's just a lot of interesting ways that this show handles its central romance while being on the backdrop of this epic story with this really cool, distinct aesthetic where everything is draped in punk and urban culture and surfing culture and like just anything that is countercultural. Like the show is just it all of it's dressed up in the idea of counterculture to the point that the ship that Renton joins, this resistance movement ship, is also a counter culture movement ship that has their own magazine like they are both anti-government and like a fashion thing it's a really interesting show with a lot going on and it was my favorite for uh only a couple weeks because i then watched gurren lagan and that supplanted it but then as time went on i felt like i i connected more with Eureka 7 just because it had so many different ideas and so much that went into it. And I haven't rewatched it over the years just because I haven't really been sure if I would be able to write about the show. And it's 50 episodes, so it would take a lot to watch through it. And again, I have this same fear of what if I don't like it as much as I did back then? Because a lot of people struggle with Eureka 7. Like, a lot of people have difficulty, especially in the early part, when it's mostly character development and it's very slow and most of the characters are kind of at each other's throats. It only really becomes this epic, fulfilling story later on, and especially the last stretch is incredible. And I have a sneaking suspicion that... Much like in the case of Evangelion, where I related to Shinji when I was younger and then Misato as an adult, I get the feeling that if I watched Eureka now, whereas, like, what I'm kind of afraid of is I won't care about Eureka all that much as a character or I won't relate to Renton because I'm not a teenager who's coming of age myself in the way that I was when I first watched the show. Because back then, all that really mattered, in much the same way that it's all that matters to Renton, all that mattered to me is that Eureka is captivatingly beautiful. Like, Renton falls in love with her at first sight before he understands anything about her and then everything he learns about her like stands to challenge the fact that he's in love with her but he's you know he keeps trying to to sort of muscle through all of that which I can also relate to when I think about it but I doubt as an adult I would be as captivated with Eureka as I was back then I'm not a uh, horny child <laughs> anymore. But I suspect that I would connect a lot more with Holland and with Talho, who are the sort of leaders of the Gecko State ship and mentors to Renton. And if not them, then other characters. It, the show has a big cast, and there's a lot of really memorable and interesting characters in it. So who knows? I definitely would like to give it another shot. And part of the reason I haven't revisited Eureka 7 or that there was there's some odd feelings towards it is because Eureka 7 I, I mentioned this in the dot hack episode that it is a show that like tried to be a franchise and everything else in the franchise other than the original show has been lackluster there was the video games which no one really cared about a bunch of manga tie-ins that aren't very good there was a film that was like a not sequel but alternate telling kind of thing nobody liked it i never even bothered because ev literally everyone i know shat on it and then they made eureka 7 ao which was a 26 episode sequel that everyone ragged on and nobody liked again i didn't watch it because all i heard about it was negative stuff so it kind of felt like okay, you know, Eureka 7's getting run into the ground and I don't want to, like, try to watch the whole franchise only to be let down by everything else. But apparently they are making a new series of three Eureka 7 movies which are going to be written by Sato Dai, who was the original writer of the series. A great writer I've talked about a lot in my old Useless Anime Knowledge videos. So I certainly wouldn't mind revisiting the series before that movie comes out or the series of movies comes out. I probably have a lot of time before they start getting released here. And maybe I'll have a lot more to say about it than I I think. I think that show probably holds up because, you know, the 
two times I watched it, both times it took my breath away equally. It's just so damn long. I do encourage everybody to go watch it, though. Especially if you like those kinds of coming-of-age stories, the Gurren Lagann-esque kind of shit. Leaping off from that, another show that was a favorite of mine sort of briefly and weirdly uh, in 2008 was Earth Maiden Arjuna, which is connected to Eureka 7 in that both of them are Shoji Kawamori sort of vehicles in a way. He had some involvement in both cases, Shoji Kawamori having been the creator of Macross, and anything he puts his name on, regardless of whether he wrote it or directed it or if all he did was robots on it, there's definitely this air of a Kawamori series where it's going to be about environmentalism and spiritualism and philosophy, and all that comes up in Eureka 7 in sort of background trapping ways. Like, the main story is the the love story and coming-of-age story, but then you've also got all these strong environmentalist messages and stuff like that and strong psychological messages. Then you've got Arjuna, and Arjuna is just about that stuff. Arjuna is what happened when Shoji Kawamori went to India and was like studying their culture and got like really really into environmentalism and it's it's kind of like a show that is intended to like red pill you <laughs> but not in the way that people use the phrase red pill it's like red pilling you to blue pill or something like that like we'll call it environmentalist red pilling it's the anime equivalent of watching like a vegan documentary that just shows you like animals getting murdered so that you'll be afraid to eat meat anymore like it's that kind of thing it's very heavy-handed in its messages, but it is a great show. It has interesting characters, a great central romance, really interesting episodic presentation. Like, each episode has some really trippy visuals and just all kinds of inventive stuff in it. And it's got phenomenal soundtrack by Yoko Kano, one of her best, in my opinion. Uh, the animation's kind of all over the place, and I mean that both in the sense of quality, but also in the sense of, like, there's lots of early CG, lots of just weird-looking stuff. It's a... Uh, it's kind of a clusterfuck, but in a good way. But basically, I, I loved the show because it made me feel woke. <laughs> I was like, oh man, I feel so spiritual and in tune with the world. And it, it was, it, it appealed to me philosophically. It gave me a lot to think about. And, you know, I was like 16. So this kind of new age rhetoric was very much able to reach me. I remember my favorite part of the show was this bit where Arjuna, I think her name was Arjuna, the main character. She goes out to like the countryside and meets this old man who's just like living in the middle of the mountain and he's just got like a house and a farm and he like grows his own plants he doesn't use any pesticides because he doesn't need to because he's not trying to raise enough food to feed a fucking whole civilization it's just enough for himself and he's talking about all the benefits of you know being disconnected from society and I always found that to be like the most idealized lifestyle to me like it's one which I could never live because I'm a 21st century digital boy and I just don't have enough empathy for the planet and I also have my own twisted philosophies about like the way that the uh the way that all of this works I've got my red pills that go in a different direction so it's like I don't know how much of the show I still agree with but I definitely feel a romantic attachment to that idea of like just disconnecting from society and going out into the middle of nowhere I've always thought of that as like the ultimate final option like if I could if I decided one day that I just could not deal with society anymore like most people kill themselves I would go out into the woods and raise my own food and live off the land you know I think that's a pretty idyllic kind of life especially if I could find a woman who'd do it with me but yeah Arjuna's kind of an odd spot in my history of having favorite anime because it was like very out of nowhere not a super seminal show that lots of people regard that way. Like, you know, if we go through my line here, Evangelion, Haruhi, NHK, Eureka 7, and Gurren Lagann, these are all very highly regarded shows. These are all shows that are in a lot of people's favorites lists. F A Tale of Memories, which was my favorite up until Arjuna, it took the spot from Gurren Lagann, was not as highly regarded, though that's partly because no one had fucking seen it at the time, um, but it did feel very specific and very for me. But Arjuna was in a totally different way. Because, like, Eureka 7, Gurren Lagann, and F are all shows about, like, characters doing what they want and reaching self-actualization and, like, coming of age and all that kind of stuff, which is, like, what I was going through at the time. Arjuna was just, like, purely out of 
philosophical stuff. Like, basically, I'm saying that I was being a pretentious twat by uh, loving this show as much as I did, I think, because very quickly I, I like fell out and was like, wait a minute. How is this my favorite anime? This makes no sense. You know, like over time, I looked at my other favorites and looked at Arjuna and was like, I couldn't even remember most of what happened in the show. Like, I remembered that it had felt so enlightening, but like, I didn't remember the characters all that well. I didn't remember like what went on in it. And I was just like, okay. Arjuna's not really my favorite anime. It just was eye-opening, which I think for a lot of people, their favorites tend to be stuff that, like, change their mind about something, especially when you're young. And then uh, if you grow up and those ideas become passe, but the show itself doesn't really hold up, then, you know, it falls by the wayside. Not that Arjuna doesn't hold up. I mean, I wouldn't know. I haven't watched it in a long-ass time. But at the very least, it's pretty and has an amazing soundtrack, so it's probably still worth watching. Another thing I thought I'd touch on, which was never necessarily a favorite of mine, but one that... I did care about a lot is King of Bandits Jing, the manga, because the anime series isn't that good comparatively, mostly because it doesn't cover as much space and it's just not well directed or animated. But the King of Bandits Jing manga was the first manga I ever purchased, the first one I ever read outside of Shonen Jump magazine. And uh, what's great about Jing is that it's just endlessly imaginative. It's this artist, Yuichi Kumakura, just like putting to paper whatever the fuck appeared in his imagination and he has this very distinctive art style in the early chapters you can definitely see a lot of like Akira Toriyama influence and it's got like a it looks a little bit more shonen but as it goes along it keeps developing more of like a western influence and a lot of like people would always compare it to like Tim Burton and stuff I don't know how much I think that I think maybe more Salvador Dali influence or like just weird art you know this is clearly a guy who looked at a lot of uh, out there art and his own art would continue to get weirder and weirder. A lot of Jing would just eventually devolve into just Jing adventuring through these dreamscape worlds. The the whole series is about a a guy called Jing. He's the king of bandits. He can steal anything. And basically each chapter will have a Jing girl, like some cute girl who is either on his side or is what he's trying to steal in the first place, or like she's, she's involved in the story somehow. And he'll go to some new location, and there's that place has a story, and he has to sort of solve that story in order to get what he came for. And in the early chapters, it's a little bit more normal, where it'll be like, he in the first chapter, he goes to a city where the, uh, there's a guy who's in charge of the city, and he has this gigantic jewel with like a mermaid inside of it. And Jing goes to steal that. Nobody can get into the guy's tower because he's got so many traps. Jing finds an inventive way to get in there and steals the thing. Very straightforward. The later chapters, the stories would get so fucking weird and almost absurd. And the worlds would get so dreamlike that sometimes I literally couldn't comprehend what was happening. It just looked so cool. (laughs) The artwork just kept getting better and better. And so, yeah, Jing was my favorite manga for a long time, mostly just for how cool the artwork is. And Jing and his sidekick Kier are fun to to read. A lot of cute girls that are all fun, cool worlds. It's just a cool story. Uh, I haven't reread it in a long time, and I doubt I'll ever find much to say about it. And I don't know if it would be, like, a favorite manga of mine at this point, because... Much like with Gunslinger Girl, like, a lot of what I loved about it is because I haven't read a whole lot of manga, so the few that really appealed to me really appealed to me, but uh, these days I've read all kinds of stuff, so who knows, but, you know, it's still a cool manga. And while we're on the subject of art, I was such a huge fan of Yoshitoshi Abe for a really long time, the guy who did the character designs for Serial Experiments Lane. He was the creator and designer of Haibane Renmei. He was the character designer for Techno Lies. And he has a bunch of art books and, like, doujinshi and stuff. And I was just really obsessed with his art. And I would check out, like, you know, I checked out all three of those shows. Oh, and Nia Under 7. I almost forgot. I watched all of those just because Yoshitoshi Abe had done the art for them. And I was just so captivated with his work. And I bought his art books and stuff. And to me, it just seemed like he had so much detail and such a distinctive look that like no one else was doing and the funny thing about it is that I just didn't understand digital art at all at the time and he was like you know an early sort of digital artist and a lot of the stuff he was doing that I saw as like a world of detail is more like you know he uses textures and stuff in 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 photoshop like he he knows how to make a really detailed looking picture without actually like hand drawing every element of it not to say 
say that he doesn't have, you know, great hand drawing abilities, but I remember distinctly when the iPad first came out, there was this video of him like drawing a girl with his finger on an iPad and it looked incredible. And it, like he did it in like five minutes and it looked great. And I was like, okay, you know, he just has a really distinctive style that comes out immediately. It's not that he's like slaving over these images or anything, but nonetheless, this is just another example of something that became more passe as time went on and there became a million artists on the internet you know like when we had the rise of pixiv and the rise of image boards like danboru and gelboru and stuff like that and i could just like find some artist doing really detailed interesting work and have all their art right there online it gradually made abe feel less and less special to me I still think he's a phenomenal character designer, and I love all the work he's done, but he is no longer, like, this pillar of my taste the way that he was back then. Like, he was the only artist I cared about in 2008, to the point that I spent a lot of money on all his art books, and I even have his doujinshi signed uh, that I bought somewhere. But, yeah, like, the level of dedication I had to him back then was definitely overblown compared to now there's, like a slew of artists who I love just as much, even just character designers I love just as much. But I am glad that I at least got to talk about that one lane illustration in the Aesthetic is Narrative video, and I kind of felt like that did justice to all those years of fandom of Abe. Like, I got to take apart one of his images and break down what was so captivating about it. And so, like, you know, even if he's not as special to me now as he was back then, and there's no way I would, like, dedicate a huge amount of time to him the way that I would have wanted to back then and wouldn't have had the words to, at least I did that. And I feel like I, on some level, justified all those years of fandom. And the last major aspect of my otakudom that I wanted to talk about that kind of faded away uh, or changed with time is my attitude towards buying things. Because when I was younger, like, the way that otakudom worked for me was all about indulging in the sort of meta of it, of buying all these figures and doujinshi and dvds and like owning all this anime crap it was like this hoarding mentality of like the collection reflects how big of a fan i am you know the more things i have the more otaku i am is kind of like the mindset i think and i would get so excited about all these figure purchases and stuff and then i had this moment and i think a lot of people probably have this moment i know my brother victor did to the extent that he put all of his toys in my room for a long time when he had this moment is when you start working or you start having you start getting money or you start needing money and you look around at all the stuff you spent money on before from back when money meant nothing to you except a means by which to buy shit and you're going, was that worth what I paid for that? Was that worth it? Did I really drop $130 on a Kanan figure and then another $130 on an Alphard figure, both from Kanan, a show that I was so sure that I loved at the time and I'm pretty sure is actually pretty much dog shit? Yeah, I did. I did do that. I do have multiple Kanan figures, you know. I don't think Kanan's necessarily a a bad show but it definitely doesn't hold up to how much I cared about it at the time just because it was a cool girl with guns Yuri show with actual animation unlike all that B train shit there was a period of time where I would look at my collection and all I did was regret it everything I looked at I regretted and I had regretted a lot of it even from the beginning because there's a lot of figures I bought on impulse that either turned out to be fake or broke easily or just didn't look as good on the shelf as it looked on the box so there's a lot of purchases I'd regretted already and then eventually it came to be that like all of it I regretted none of it seemed worth it why do I have this super expensive black rock shooter figure like it looks cool and all but after about a year that shit becomes passe like yeah it looked really cool when I bought it and now it's like I've seen this fucking thing forever I'm no longer impressed with it. The worst is art books, because I spent a lot of money on art books, and I've read almost none of them. Like, I have not even flipped through a lot of the art books I have. I just bought them because they look cool, and I put them on a shelf, and I never looked at them again. I think the only one I've read all the way through, uh, to the only two, are like the, the Lane art book and the Ponyo art book. And I've flipped through a couple of the others, but I don't, it's not something I pull off the shelf and look through, you know, regularly. And even then, some of them never have. 
So yeah, that art books always seemed like a huge waste of money to me. I stopped buying DVDs and Blu-rays because they stopped being worth it. It became that you could stream everything for probably even higher quality than what you can get on the fucking Blu-rays, and they no longer even look cool on your shelf. They're just these little fucking blue cases with nothing in them but two discs, you know? Fuck that. I mean, at some point, once I had enough figures to fill up my shelves, it felt like I don't even need any more. Like, not only is it always disappointing to buy a new one and then realize I'm not going to do anything with it, and there were some... I've found ways to justify this for such a long time. Once I got back into anime in 2014, then I felt like buying regular figures wasn't worth it, but surely buying Nendoroids or Figmas would be worth it because they're poseable. I can find some way to use them in videos. I can find some way to involve these in my career, surely. And by the time 2015 rolled around, I developed a philosophy of, all right, well, I'm not going to buy anything unless it can show up in a video and therefore be a tax write-off. Like, I'll spend money on only stuff that will assist in some way in my career. So my conclusion was posters, t-shirts, and art books or figures if they're going to go on display in the background. So I did end up buying even more art books and stuff, uh, which I but I ended up stopping that because it just isn't worth it. Like, I, I still buy posters just because you're always going to be able to see the posters in the background, you know, so I know they're going to get some mileage or T-shirts. Like, not only does it mean I have a shirt, something I can wear, but I know I'm going to get mileage out of it in videos, so... Yeah, I spent a lot more time buying stuff like that. And now it's kind of come to the point where the main thing I buy that's anime related is manga. Because I prefer to read manga physically as opposed to online, and therefore it's like worth it to just buy a series I haven't even read just to read it. And so I've been buying tons and tons of manga. Because the funny thing is that I've kind of come full circle on this. Where when I was first starting to make money, and first starting to need money then suddenly all of my figures and all my expenses looked like a huge waste. But now that I make a lot more money and that I can throw down $100 because I feel like it, now it's like, oh, okay, well, you know, 60 bucks for a really cute toy might be worth it. I haven't seen anything that's inspired that level of, like, that sheer, like, I looked at it and the price almost didn't matter. Like, there's a few, I keep seeing, like, these card capture Sakura uh, posable figures that, like, I want it, but I'm not willing to pay $65 for it, you know? It's just like, uh, I know I'm never going to look at this, I'm never going to pose it, I'm never going to play with it, uh, let's not, you know? But... I'm sure that one of these days, I'm finally going to come face to face. Like, if uh, if they make a figure of, like, Chiharu from, I think that was her name, from Girlish Number, I might have to. Like, if it's really cute. Not if it's in some fucking, if they put her in a goddamn, like, school bathing suit or something, I'm going to be fucking pissed. Because I cannot stand that. But, like, if they give me a really cute figure of her, I'll probably have to buy it. You know? Was that her name? Chiharu? What the fuck was her name? My favorite character of 2016, who I wrote several videos about, and I can't even remember exactly what her name is. It was Chi something, I think. I'm a terrible person. So yeah, that's why I haven't been buying any new fi figures, art books, DVDs. You probably have noticed that like, if you watch my videos, it's always the same crap in the background. Very rarely does anything change except maybe poster layouts, and that's because like, as I got older, I just thought, like, this stuff's all dumb, and I don't know why I have this stuff. But, you know, maybe I'll buy more of it in the future. My feelings keep changing about this kind of shit. It really depends on what seems worth it. And now I'm spending lots of money on manga, so we'll see how it goes. And with that, I feel like I've kind of caught up. And this has been a really gratifying series to do. Because even though each of these maybe hasn't been the most, like informative or interesting videos so much of it has just been about my past with something or my impressions of it which is the kind of stuff that I usually rag on people for focusing too much about but I figure if I made a whole series just about that then you can pretty quickly catch on and stop listening if you're not interested but it's been a good way for me to sort of put all these feelings to rest finally like I feel as though I could now talk about any of these shows and do whatever I want about them because there's no longer this pressure to live up to my past self's feelings, you know? Like, there's not this worry that I will watch Manabi Straight and end up writing a negative review of it before I ever had the chance to write the positive review I always dreamed of, you know? Like, that's sort of the fear. Like, I would hate to have, for instance, Eureka 7. I would hate to have been a diehard 
hardcore fan of it and to consider it one of my favorite anime for years and years and then never talk about how much I love it, rewatch it, not like it as much, and write about how much uh, it's okay. You know, that that's a, a real fear of mine. So I'm glad I've got this all off my chest. So if you see me write a video about any of these shows and my opinion changes dramatically, you'll all know that it was a change of opinion, that it wasn't like this before, you know. Uh, I mean, there's other shows I could mention. Like, you know, I loved Steins Gate in 2011. I don't know how I'd feel about it now. Uh, the, you know, there's a, there's a few more like that, but none that are like a big deal. So, yeah, I finally crossed this bridge and hopefully this will open me up to revisit a lot more of these shows again. And to revisit more of my history and sort of come to terms with it. So really glad I did this. I hope you all enjoyed. I hope this was interesting. I haven't even seen reactions to any of it yet because I'm recording all of it before any of it goes live. So uh, I have to go deal with the hell of editing everything from episode 5 up all at once. And if you guys really, really liked this series, if anybody would desperately like for this to continue then let me know and maybe there will be a season two at some point in the future or maybe it'll be a different kind of series because I kind of covered everything in this one. I almost had to stretch to even find enough to make 13 episodes, but I could certainly approach something like this from a different angle or do another 13 episode podcast series in the future. So you know, give me any ideas you've got about something like that. And uh, thanks again for listening. I'll see you next time.